Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. As British jets take to the air over Iraq again and the Islamic State encroaches on Baghdad, our subjects this morning could scarcely be more pertinent. The author, Karen Armstrong, an award-winning historian of religion, is here to talk about her book Fields of Blood, in which she sets out to refute what she sees as a false association between religion and violence. Religion has been made a scapegoat, she argues, for crimes and killings that find their real causes elsewhere. Christopher Coker, Professor of International Relations at the LSE, is taking on an entrenched received opinion too because his short polemic, Can War Be Eliminated?, opens with the provocative statement that war is not just a bad idea that we can cash in for a better one. And religion, war and a sense of historical inevitability also come together in Justin Marozzi's study of Baghdad, once the intellectual centre of the known world, now a violent shadow of its former glory. And also, one might add, exhibit number one for anyone wanting to put the case that uh, religion is at the heart of many of the bloodier conflicts in history. Karen Armstrong, you've set out to challenge that idea with your book. Are you taking issue with a, a, a specifically modern idea, what you might call the missionary atheism of, say, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, or is this an older notion that I, you're tackling? I think it dates back to the early modern period, which is the time when we separated religion and politics um, and created the first sort of secular ideology. Um, and I'm not saying, actually, that religion is never a factor, um, it, it's, but it's never the sole one, nor is it even the chief one. Um, religion in pre-modern uh, society permeated all aspects of life, all activities, and um, the, uh, no other uh, culture has anything like our idea of religion as a separate activity, uh, cordoned off from all others, um, and um, with a centering around a supernatural god with a, a set of beliefs and practices that are standard throughout. So is your argument that, as it were, in the pre-modern era, uh, it's impossible to single out religion yes. because you can't single out religion in any case? It's all it's, so much intermingled. Yes. Now, what about the, po that, the, the, the era that follows when religion in certain societies has been established as a kind of private business, your own confessional um, entitlement, but nothing to do with the state. Uh, that, uh, that's, in, that's in Western countries mainly, um, and I, you can't really say uh, that uh, things have been any the, the less violent, um, because I think warfare, I, I, I think, I, will always be with us. Um, and lot, for many reasons, not least because men just love fighting. Um, and uh, the state cannot exist without its armies. Um, a state needs it, it is based on a forcible uh, su suppression of people. You, you go into detail about all yes. of the other reasons, the economic reasons, uh, as it were, even the racial reasons for war. But you also quote um, Chris Hedges, who's a, a New York Times mm. war correspondent, rather pointedly. You, say, he, you quote him and he writes this. Most of us willingly accept war as long as we can fold it into a belief system that paints the ensuing suffering as necessary for a higher good. Uh, isn't that precisely the point that nothing we found is as good as religion for providing that belief system? I, I think nationalism has also been uh, very good I mean, uh, f at creating warfare and its short history. I mean, it's quite interesting that the French revolutionaries uh, tried to abolish Catholicism uh, and did so very violently in Fr France after the revolution. And no sooner had they got rid of one religion than they created another, the devotion to the nation, which they celebrated in elaborate rituals. And uh, the nation has had an extremely violent history. Um, that's a bit of a catch-22 for your argument, though, isn't it? I mean, I, thought, I think that's interesting. You make the point several uh, several places mm -hmm. in the book that um, nationalism is converted into a kind of secular religion. Yes. So it is the religious instinct that's a problem here. Well, I, I, what is the religious instinct? Because... Uh, well, I, to, to, <laughs> you're to, better equipped to answer yes. that than me. So. To, uh, to, to paraphrase uh, a famous commercial... Um, the weather does lots of different things, and so does religion. Um, it's not all about peace, nor is it all about war. Sometimes uh, religion has actually tried to sort of e extract 
uh, violence, both from its own traditions, rituals, and and ideologies, uh, and, and and that has been a con as continuous a theme in the history of religion as any wars or crusades. Why does it continuously fail? Because I think because I think we are violent creatures. Um, and the state is a violent institution. A, a pivotal figure, a sort of emblematic figure, is the Emperor Ashoka, um, a third century Emperor BC and Emperor of India, who was had a conversion during an appalling uh, uh, sort of war with, with a rebellious city and put up inscriptions all over uh, his all over his empire on huge rock faces and ma massive cylindrical uh, pillars calling for peace, calling for tolerance, uh, crying out against the horror and cruelty of warfare. Uh, but he could never disband his army. Had he done so, um, the other Ar would be wannabe emperors would all be fighting one another and there'd, there'd be mayhem. It, in fact, people found that one of the best me methods for getting peace in the world was, in the pre-modern world, a very strong empire that could keep uh, smaller fry in check. Um, you have a very, another very interesting instance, which is uh, in the Jewish faith, an attempt um, immediately after the kind of Roman Empire, uh, an att attempt to resist the Roman Empire has resulted in very, very bloodily. The Jewish faith actually takes itself and says, OK, we're going to remake ourselves. Yes as pacifists, uh, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't work, or it doesn't stick. Well, it stuck for about a millennium, um, and it became absolutely taboo, for example, to think of going to the Holy Land and setting up a state there. Um, the rabbis uh, were converting, after the horror of the Jewish war which, with, against Rome, which resulted in the destruction of the temple, they had to convert Judaism from a temple religion to a religion of the book. And they did so by extracting all the violence from um, the, the scriptures. So Joshua and David, who were mighty warriors, are presented as um, very peaceable Torah students who were not interested in warfare at all. And, um, and it was an attempt, as it were, to tame the beast, uh, to say we never again can we, because it's resulting in too much loss of Jewish life. The same happened in the early Shia too, when there was so much loss of, of life in these revolutions again, uh, and, and, and uh, uprisings uh, that the sixth imam uh, of the Shia said, no, we're, we're coming out now uh, of warfare and will remain a principal protest outside uh, the state. Um, it's, is it fair to say, though, that those attempts to pacify scripture and to, as it were, to, to, to take the belligerence out of scripture are the exception rather than the rule. Uh, most scriptures contain, I mean, both the, the Old Testament and the Quran both contain uh, exhortations to violence. Yes, they do, because we are violent creatures and our scriptures are violent too. Uh, but is, but it, is it not then re reasonable to say, well, actually, religion is uh, in the dock here? Well, it is, and it's also been a force for peace. It's never one thing. And the, the idea of saying that there is a single unvarying essence of religion, which is violent, is a modern uh, invention. A, a, a religion was made the violent other. Can I, can I just come back, though? Who is saying that? Because I think, I think most people do look at religion and say, well, on the one hand, it, it does marvellous things in terms of charity and, and so on, but on the other hand, there are these problems. Well, you must know nicer people than I do. I mean, I, who I, is it that you're encountering, though? That's, uh, taxi that has... drivers, for example, uh, who ask me what I do for a living. And I, and all, nearly always, in the same sort of set of words, say, well, religion's been responsible for all the major wars in history. And it's an absurd comment, because obviously the two world wars were not fought for religion in that sense. Um, but it, but no, I, I think that I, I, you just meet people and they tell you, uh, oh, well, you're writing about war and religion. Well, you know that, that it's got, it's got, it's uh, that, that's what it does. Um, do, uh, do our, you... uh, also, our scriptures. We have a rather simplistic idea of what scripture is. Uh, the 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 sagas, violent sagas in the what we call the Old Testament originally probably had no religious function at all, but were simply a national saga uh, that became that Kate became central really to Jewish life after the loss of the temple. But isn't the anxiety that it's not it's never going to be a problem what a scholar of comparative religions thinks of these texts? The problem is what a young 18-year-old in Mosul yes. thinks of these texts. Uh, and then they become lethal. Uh, they can be, 
uh, but but you have to be quite selective in your uh, in your understanding of scripture. Pe- forensic psychiatrists who have um, talked to some of the a lot of these people uh, say that only about twenty five percent of them have a, a, a very good knowledge of scripture. A lot of them are sort of born again, self taught, or converts, and often they don't start reading the Quran in the fullness until they get into jail. Um, and then they discover that things are more complex than that. And I think, again, to say that, uh, uh, that people just go off to uh, Baghdad, for example, because they want uh, to fulfill the Quranic injunction is absurd. Uh, two wannabe uh, jihadis who uh, uh, were con- pleaded guilty to uh, terrorist charges uh, a couple of months ago had ordered from Amazon.com uh, Islam for Dummies. Um, and that was about the, the the sum total of their understanding. Was they wanted young men want to fight. Uh, a lot, the, a lot of the motivation for this comes not from simply reading the Quran, but for looking at images of Muslim suffering around the world, uh, seeing uh, images of uh, houses being yeah. bulldozed in Israel. You're uh, absolutely right. But I mean, to which one will I answer? Two things. One is that their identity, their sense as a group, an embattled group, is absolutely to do with their religious yes. identity. Yes, it is. It, yes, indeed it is, but it's not confined to religion. If you can imagine, at the time of the Spanish Civil War, for example, a lot of young um, men went off who were not religious at all to fight in that war again, but it was another sense of identity there. Um, Christopher Coker, do you, um, do you kind of... Um have a sense of recognition when I think Karen you said war, war is always with us I mean that's um, feeds rather into your theories here doesn't it? Indeed and one of the issues I look at is boredom um, mm. which is I yes. think the most important factor of talk particularly for young men but if I just uh, to p- pick up a point that you made of course it has been argued that fascism and communism were political religions mm. uh, with all the, 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 the trappings of religion with prophets and with uh, holy books etc and one could even argue that those young men who went off to Spain to fight for fascism as well as of course for the republic we forget that were essentially jihadists uh, of their day uh, Yeah I, I think that, that's in a sense, the point I'm trying to make, that religion, what we call this religious impulse, is not confined to denominations and and certain theological Mm. paradigms, but pervades human life. And I entirely agree with you about the boredom. I think that's the point that Chris Hedges is making, uh, that the the utter tedium and and triviality of our lives. We are people who like meaning in our lives. We are animals who get very distressed if we don't find some value in what we're doing. And we inject that meaning into our lives in all manner of ways, in terms of art too. But it's terrifying sometimes what we're prepared to do to get that meaning. Justin Marazzi. Karen, I was very interested in what you were writing about jihad and um, in particular you talk about it in the context of being a response um, on the one hand to Western imperialism and also the Palestinian question. I've spent a lot of the last decade in places like Iraq, Afghanistan and Somalia surrounded by certain types of jihadis. And I mean, would you agree that for some of these people, it is a worldview of Islam supremacism. It's not just about being anti-Western. It's about painting the whole world black under the, this, this Islamic banner. So a fairly purely uh, religious motive, perhaps. No, I wouldn't say it. I, I, I don't think that kind of imperialism is confined to religion at all. Um, the, you know, as you say, the, 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 the communists had it, the fascists had it. But for the Jihadis uh, the in particular. Americans had it. Um, I... I would say that what what you're seeing... I mean, they're, not, they're not trying to bring free markets to the no, world. No, they're certainly it, not. It, it's about the black flag and certain way of life. I think, too, it's the, it's a, it's a, it's the experience of humiliation. I think if you see, um, the, think that before uh, the modern period, Islam was a very great world power, probably the greatest power in the world, and overnight it was reduced by the colonialists to a dependent bloc. And I think that Islam being very much a religion of success, uh, that it's extraordinary success in coming out of nowhere and sort of almost endorsed its message. Christianity starts with the great failure, the crucifixion. And it's been uh, so we're more used to it, though. I do say to Americans sometimes, how are you going to feel when you're superseded by China? Um, and there's a sort of Long shudder. In, there's a shudder in the room. Uh, because it's that 
humiliation, I think, is also a major source of, of that kind of conflict. Um, Justin Morancy, I mean, there's a per- pertinent question to ask here, which is, would Baghdad be better without confessional difference? Would it be a better city if it was... Well, if, you, if you're talking about 2014, I think almost certainly yes. The, this is a city that has been incredibly cosmopolitan. Uh, Jews and Christians predate Muslims uh, in the city. And today, I mean, until very recently, this was a mixed, uh, also Sunni-Shia city. Increasingly now, it is a Shia city, uh, a ghettoized, compartmentalized, uh, blast wall separating communities, and a city sort of punctuated by the very real risk of car bombings every time you go shopping in the vegetable market. Now, uh, there's a terrible falling off there because your book, um, Baghdad, City of Peace, City of Blood, that subtitle is interesting. Now, the second half of it has totally eclipsed the first half. None of us really know about the first half. Tell us about the City of Peace, the moment at which it was the greatest city in the world. Well, probably. Karen just touched on that earlier, you know, when, when Islam was the, the, the be-all and the end-all, really, and, and Baghdad is the centre of that. It takes over from Damascus as the, the capital of Islam when Mansur founds this great city in 762. It's the world's first round city. It astounds everyone who visits it with its sheer opulence, the magnificence I mean, it, it, of its it, creation. It's, a, it's essentially a new city, it's a new isn't city, it? Yeah. It raises it and builds it People, from... People tend to think Baghdad is much older than it really is. It's not Nineveh, it's not Ur, it's, it's, it's 762, 8th century. Um, and very early on, it becomes the centre of this great uh, economic boom. There's a property boom. And it, within decades, it's attracting some of the finest minds from the Atlantic in the West to Central Asia in the East. Scholars, uh, scientists, astronomers, mathematicians, physicians, lexicographers, legalists, and so on. It becomes the intellectual capital of the planet in very quick order. Um, as I was reading it, there was a kind of mystery for me. It may not be a mystery for you, which is that the um, the Abbasids, Mansur, uh, as it were, kind of takes over from the Umayyads. Umayyad scholarship is conservative. It's yes. consolidatory. It's completely inward looking. It's rather like Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, maybe now. Totally conservative. Abbasid scholarship is exactly the opposite. It's outward looking, curious, speculative. <laughs> What makes that happen? Is that a difference to do with personalities or is it to do with trade? Or I think trade and cosmopolitanism are, are very much part of that. This is a, a, a truly international city. And, and Damascus it has a much shorter period in the sun. It's less than a century. Baghdad has about 500 years. It really establishes itself as the sort of the, a, like a cultural mecca almost um, in, with an incredibly impressive record of scholarship, especially in the um, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries. It starts to tail off a little bit after that and the caliph becomes a bit of a figurehead puppet in very splendid isolation in, in a series of expanding uh, palaces. Um, with, with, with retreating slightly from, from political power. So the heyday is at the front end of that 500 years, and it, then it all comes crashing down in 1258 uh, with Hulagu, Genghis Khan's grandson. And, and, and you start marking off then the, the, the tapering off and, and the precipitous decline with Tamerlane coming in uh, a century and a half later in 1401. You know, this w- wave of repeated destructions of the city and f- from which can barely recover and then another one comes Absolutely. again. Absolutely. I, I just want to go back, though, to Mansur again because uh, it's impossible to avoid the historical ironies here. Very early in your book, you're, you're talking about you know, black flags raised in rebellion, thousands of young men rallying, thousands of sheer young men rallying to the cause of religious freedom against a corrupt government. This is in 1747. <laughs> They've seen it all before, haven't they? I mean, my favourite Mansour story um, is 775. Um, he's just died on his way to Hajj, to Mecca, and he's left strict instructions with his son and heir, Mahdi, and his daughter-in-law, Rita, to, first of all, confirm he has died. And if that's confirmed, they, they, they are to take a key to a, a secret underground storeroom um, and open it up. And so they duly trot off underground, expecting to find huge stores of wealth, gold, silver, precious jewels. And instead, they open the door and the whole crypt is full of corpses, men, women, children. And every single one of them is from the party of Ali. They are Shia. So, um, I mean, Karen and I may talk about this a little bit later, but those Sunni Shia tensions are there from the very outset uh, in Baghdad. It's intriguing, isn't it? Mansour, kind of, he sort of tricks the Shia into fighting for him and conceals his real allegiances, and then, and then out it comes emerges, the sword. out comes the sword. Um, and in his fairly short uh, period in, in power, the, you know, the, 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 the persecution of the Shia um, you know, rages forward. And I suppose if you go forward right to 2003, with the briefest of exceptions in about the 10th century, 
Sunni minority has held power in this part of the world. And, and that's the great trauma that 2003 unleashed, which we, we're now seeing. You, you, we just mentioned it on the news with um, IS forces outside Baghdad as we speak. Um, now, we're implicated here, too. There's a fascinating chapter about the British in, in Baghdad. And uh, it's a sort of mixed tale because you've got Gertrude Bell, who's a great Orientalist, uh, a great scholar, very sympathetic. And she has the idea that the British are going to usher in a new great era for Baghdad, made it the centre of civilization and prosperity. Uh, it doesn't happen, does it? Well, with, with, within, within um, moments almost of, of writing that letter to her father when she talks about rebuilding Baghdad as the centre, a centre of prosperity and peace, the entire country is on fire. And the, only, the three main cities of Mosul, Baghdad and Basra are the only ones outside rebel hands. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia writes to the Sunday Times about the people of Britain being trapped. Um, how are they going to escape this um, w- without sacrificing thousands of lives, um, Arabs, um, in a policy that only benefits the colonial administrators? And what struck me very much was the similarity in the rhetoric that the British used ahead of 1917 and then the Americans in 2003. We're going to come and make your country a better place because we say so. Uh, that obviously has not worked. Um, is there is there anything that might? I mean, do you, as a kind of long time resident of the city, see it as an intractable? Well, I think what I was almost, almost confused about is, is this enduring belief in the West that we, as 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 the West, can do something about a country which is thousands of miles away, very different culture. And, and and sort of ride roughshod over the neighbours' views as well. Iran is absolutely key to this, but no one seems to think they have a, a decent say in, in what happens next. Um, I want to ask you, because it, it relates back to, to Karen's book, um, this rather interesting moment when Islamic State first threatened, uh, you know, the border, came over the borders of Iraq and Baghdad was first threatened. There was an interesting social network movement called Sushi, where lots of people who had intermarried said, I'm not Sunni, I'm not Shia, I'm sushi. And there were lots of people holding up placards. There was a sort of real sense there's a unity here which kind of overrides all of it. I thought it was an interesting case of the nation state, as it were, suppressing religious differences rather than exacerbating mm. them. Mm. Um, is that is that a flash in the pan, or is there a real possibility that that might? Well, the Baghdadis may, may sort the of Baghdadis may that, see that, that they feeling. have an identity larger than Shia and Sunni. I think it's a lovely thought. Um, at the moment, I just think things are too violent, too dangerous, too inward-looking, and too conservative for that really to take root. But one of my best friends in Iraqi who says, "I'm not. I know that I'm neither Sunni nor Shia." I'm Iraqi, I'm mixed. Um, but it just takes a, a relatively small number of the extremists on either side to stir things up. And it's always been a flashpan of violence. Karen Armstrong. I think part of the problem is is that, you know, we've got the idea of Sunnis in one camp, Shia in the other. And that's really quite a recent development because in the early uh, the early years of Islam, you could be a bit of both uh, in, in that Sushi way. Uh, well, it's but, not. Uh, it but, goes back quite a long way, doesn't it? Because just in Morocco, I was just coming on to this. <laughs> um, the the um, <clears throat> but the differences between the two are essentially political, uh, because Islam, because in Islam uh, politics has a sacral value, so that uh, they, they, there's no theological difference between the, between the Sunni and the Shia at all. But it is a different view of how uh, that how religion should fit into the state. Um, and the but, Shia formed a piety of protest uh, against the injustice, the structural injustice that would characterise any any sort of major um, empire. And therefore, they were casting themselves as rebels and would be put down. I, I just want to come in here. You, you may be right in saying that it's a political difference, but political, you know, politics in this country is not conducted through the medium of the car bomb. It is in Iraq. Yes. but And, and it may be because they uh, identify themselves by, by a religious and therefore com- compelling the, sacred duty. The issue of the car bomb and the suicide uh, attack um, is much more checkered than people imagine. Um, people have, scholars like Robert Pape, who've made a study of every single suicide attack that has taken place between 1980 and 2004, have found that most of them were committed by secularists. Oh yes, I'm not. I'm not denying that there are uh, other so reasons. People there are that, other reasons, especially yes. when people see. One of the main reasons is when people see a liberal democracy invading what they regard as their homeland. Uh, Christopher Goke, you want to come in here? Point out the car bomb is actually an invention of anarchism at <laughs> yes. the beginning of the 20th century. So it's actually a Western yes. invention, not an Islamic That's one. That's interesting. Um, it's also Western export, unfortunately. Mm. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, Western societies have found ways to conduct politics. Uh, by means other than murder. 
Uh, well, well we, 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 we bought into an 18th century Enlightenment idea that essentially you can't dissuade someone from their religious beliefs, you can't argue them out of their religious convictions, but you can argue people out of their political beliefs, and you do that through trust and civility. You have to trust your neighbour to actually have an opinion which is worth expressing, and you do it through civility, you do it by listening, and then through persuasion. That, I think, is essentially the Western 18th century invention. Uh, when, you say we, when you say we, buy, we bought mm. into it, do you suggest that we've kind of slightly well, duped into believing it or we were beheading people very happily uh, until the mid uh, 18th century so yes so it's even a, it's if a very even, recent invention uh, even if it's an illusion though it's a it's a help i think one. civility was largely absent from political debate until then. yeah Karen I, Armstrong. I, I, yes i would think i think too when we're looking at places like iraq i'm coming back to your point about the west coming in and saying we can solve all this i think that our modernity and our mod- modern institutions uh, came with political subjugation and, and colonial subjugation, colonial humiliation. Uh, in the one of the ingredients, two ingredients of Western modernity, uh, the creating the Western spirit were independence and innovation. Uh, but uh, it, it, modernity came to the Middle East with political dependence and subjugation, and they could never innovate. They could only imitate and copy us. So the whole thing got skewed in some sense. Um, and so uh, we, and also the, the, the birth of these post-colonial states was so unnatural as we imposed these national boundaries on them. And then the these reformers tried to secularize them and could only do so violently. And it has left a sort of a great muddle and a sense of frustration and uh, despair. Um, this, this is an ancient history too, isn't it? The carving up of of territories and Absolutely. laying lines on the map which don't necessarily relate to... The, 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 what, the thing I struck me um, when Karen was just talking this, just a moment ago on the, the trajectory of ba- Baghdad's history, it, it, it's a fairly obvious point, but it, it does best when, it, when it's running itself. So those 500 years, it's at the apex of world civilization. Then you have Hulagu coming in, then Tamerlane, then Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, 380 odd years under the Ottomans, and then the British. So centuries and centuries have gone by, which Baghdad is, is almost a pawn in, in big power politics. Um, building up this sense of resentment that we, we touched on. I mean, a harsh earlier. answer to that might be, well, of course the outside powers come in because they're just not strong enough to prevent it. So that there's a sort of inherent weakness there which is seized upon by... Yes, I mean, it, 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 the empire has gone decadent. First, they're attacked from the east and then the west. Um, and at the moment, you know, I- Iraq is... is so far away from its former glory, it's, you know, it's unfathomable how, how low this, this great city has sunk. Um, I, do you feel hopeless about it? I think I do. I mean, I had a great Iraqi friend staying with me this summer um, before ISIS really exploded onto, the, onto the, the, the airwaves, and he said Iraqis have no hope for the future. A very sober comment. You also, but you also have somebody in your book saying, well, like, these things go in cycles. I mean, they I, think I wanted in terms to end the book on a little years. note of optimism, and he <laughs> says, may the city of peace live up to its name. And, you know, we, we, one has to hope that. But at the moment, the short term prospects ain't looking very good. Uh, Christopher Goko, I'm going to turn to you because that kind of sense of, um, well, lack of hope perhaps is is one of the elements of your book. Um, you start it with this very arresting sentence. War is not pathological any more than it is socially dysfunctional and it most certainly is not just a bad idea that we can cash in for a better one. Uh, peace, meaning, meaning peace. Uh, can you just explain that, untangle that idea a little bit? Yes, uh, first I just... Um just say that uh, George Orwell famously said that after all the other isms have been discredited pessimism would still reign supreme so <laughs> I think that's the best ideology to probably follow um, there, there, there is a school of thought that, that war is just an, an idea, a, a meme as Richard Dawkins would say that has implanted itself in our brains and we can actually argue ourselves out of it um, but Jonathan Swift said you can't argue anything out of a person if, unless it's been argued into them in the first place and, and war is something that we do, it, it is, it is cultural, it's not biological. Aggression and violence is biological, but it's a cultural product like slavery and like other institutions, which we also thought we had abolished. But there are 27 million slaves in the world today, according to the United Nations, possibly more. Uh, It's adaptive and its evolutionary possibilities are the ones that we really have to take into account. Um, I think a lot of people will be prepared to go with you uh, in in arguing that it's uh, it's part of the human condition. Uh, The ones, the, the phrases that I wanted you to answer to, they were the it is not pathologic and it is not socially dysfunctional. Because that seems to suggest it has a utility uh, or it, a purpose in human society. And, and is that what you're arguing? 
It certainly does have a utility, right. and one of the reasons why we went out of the organized slavery business was when it ceased to have utility with the Industrial Revolution, and one just didn't need slaves, one needed hands who were at their machines perpetually. Um, so that's a, that is a, a very, I think, important point uh, to get across. Uh, it's not pathological. It has served a purpose. It actually has been quite creative. Uh, Ian Morris, the uh, historian at Stanford, has written a book called War, What Is It Good For?, uh, arguing that it has actually been one of the most progressive of forces. His mistake, I think, in the book, as I've uh, pointed out to him, is that it's teleological. Uh, he assumes that somehow there's this progress uh, in, in history and that we're going to end up in a period, we're almost there, he says, where we will go out of the war business. Unfortunately, that's not the case. But I, I take it this your approach is not a kind of blood and steel, war is good for the human soul, war is good for national character. That's not what you're saying. Is Aristotle it? put it best in the politics where he said the only purpose of war is peace. And the only ideology to have rejected that idea is fascism that believed in the absolute value of war and completely discredited and devalued peace. The problem is, of course, it's your peace. It's peace on your terms. It's your understanding of what is going to be a perpetual uh, system in the world. And that, of course, leads to war. It's a vicious circle. Well, you make the point that the um, Pax Britannica um, of the British Empire involved almost permanent pacification. Mm. Pacification being uh, an, another word for getting out the machine guns and shooting people who disagreed well, with you. Roman historian Tacitus put it very well. They create a desert and call it peace. Uh, that is what empire is. It's permanent pacification. Uh, there are some empires that are a little better than other empires, and there are some empires that don't actually need to pacify their subjects at a certain point. But unfortunately, that's the reality. Um, I was a little uncertain about whether you felt we are, uh, because at one point you say we're enthralled to our inherited biology, at other points, you seem to say, well, we're not just the creatures of our biology. We have choices to make. Uh, and I wondered if there's a contradiction there. I mean, are we, are we still, as it were, violent chimps or are we not? We have, we have culture. And um, a recent book, uh, A Brief History of Homo Sapiens, by an Israeli scholar, that says that the important point is we have imagination. So we can actually imagine a, a, war, a world at peace with itself. Um, and that's a very, very powerful idea that is lodged in our minds. Getting to realise that idea is the problem. Um, and might evolution not take us? You seem to suggest that we're not evolving our way out of war. We are evolving our ways, our way into new forms of war. Uh, why might it not be possible, as, say, uh, Stephen Pinker has argued, that we just evolve to become a more peaceful creature? There are two Stephen Pinkers. The one that you're referring to is The Better Angels of Our Nature, the author of that book, but there's also the author of The Blank Slate, in which he said something quite different and took a kind of quasi-Hobbesian view uh, of the world. And the point I would make about Pinker is that he's absolutely right. There is a civilizing process. This idea was first put forward by Norbert Elias back in the 40s and 50s. It's not new. Uh, and undoubtedly, the incidence of violence uh, is, is going down in our societies at this stage of history. And I have to say at this stage of history, because nothing is irreversible. Uh, everything can be arrested, everything can go into reverse, and I think what we're seeing in the world today, it's a very grim prospect, I don't remember it this grim for the last 25 years, is reversal. Um, and this, I think, is, is your story of, of Baghdad, a city that tries to go forward and is always brought back by the, the violence of the political landscape. Um, you talk about various things that, as it were, might cause that reversal, the, the, uh, the, the attractions of war. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is the idea of narrative. You were talking earlier about boredom and how important boredom is in, in fermenting war. Uh, <laughs> you're very strong on narrative and how enthralled we are to stories of war, um, including um, the use of science fiction novels and science fiction writers teaching at the highest levels in American military colleges. Uh, now, is that because we just like the stories? We like to be... Well, we're a storytelling species. I mean, that's how we actually cooperate. We have to remember that conflict and cooperation are two sides of the same coin. Uh, what enables us to cooperate also enables us to align with others, to fix alliances, to nobble people. Um, and we do this through storytelling. We, we, we have to say that this person is trustworthy, tell you an anecdote which illustrates how you can put your trust in that particular person. That is the basis of alliance building. Without stories, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. If um, it leads, it leads. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you know that as a journalist, but, it, I mean, it also uh, is a feature of scriptures. Yes. We were talking earlier that, that a narrative is stronger and more powerful and more sort of attracts us more if it has conflict in it. 
It, it, that is the case. Um, and, but uh, we've also tried to create uh, stories about peace, too, and visions of peace. Uh, we, we are conflicted. Can you give me an example of one that's as compelling, though? Because uh, there no. isn't... There isn't the, peace it, does not have its Iliad or its Odyssey, does it? No, it doesn't. As far, I, 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 don't, I don't think it does. But you look at some of the uh, images of the prophets uh, of, of Jerusalem at the end of time with all the... Uh, but it's still, it's even there. This is peace on. This is peace for Israel, and other people are being subjugated. This is, I think, the political reality. And, and I've been writing about the Roman Empire just recently, and the Pax Romana was imposed with merciless violence. The crucifixion being one of the great deterrents to any form of rebellion. Well, you you also point out. I mean, similar. <laughs> The, the the Ottoman Empire, there was a kind of period of eight years when there was no fighting yes. in order to preserve the Ottoman peace. Exactly, uh, because a, 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 an empire is established by violence and it is maintained by violence. And without violence, uh, I, I believe some historians of religion say we would probably, without warfare, we'd probably have degenerated into endlessly warring hordes, uh, fighting one another. Um, with, and not being uh, peace not being imposed upon us from above. Um, Christopher Coker, I want to come back to you to talk a little bit about technology because some people, um, uh, people have always dreamt that technology would help us out of this problem. You uh, very uh, tartly point out that the Wright brothers, Marconi and Sir Henry Maxim, all believed that their inventions were going to put a stop to war. All they did was make it more lethal, uh, you know, extend its reach. Um, is technology going to solve the problem for us, drones and so on, or is it just going to extend war into a more terrible arena? It's going to give us uh, new options, just as we took war into the third dimension for the first time in the early 20th century. So we're taking it into cyberspace. We'll soon be taking it into outer space, because I suspect that the outer space treaty is unsustainable, the one that we negotiated in 1967. So that is the, the potential of war. It has this ability to offer new opportunities just when you're thinking you're out of the war business. The only thing that stops technology being absolutely lethal is a failure of imagination. I always draw my students' attention to a, a, a silent movie that came out in 1909, which showed uh, three anarchists in biplanes flying into the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in the centre of globalisation, London uh, at the time. And it took terrorists 70 years to work out that this was actually not a bad idea. You can use air power very effectively, more effectively than hijacking planes in the Middle East in the 1970s, for example. Uh, Justin Marazzi. Christopher, you um, write about the, the increase in technology and the, the greater powers of destruction it brings. If, if we look back across the continuum from you know, stones and slings to nuclear weapons, do you feel that inevitably we will at some point design a weapon system so powerful it actually eliminates Homo sapiens? We thought we had done this with the atomic bomb in 1945. We haven't. In fact, we're entering now the second nuclear age, as it's often called, where people want to use these weapons, and they will use them at some point uh, in creative ways that we can't even imagine. But it's interesting you mention the sling, because in Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, David and Goliath, he says the reason why David won uh, was that, first of all, Goliath was suffering from myopia, uh, tunnel vision. He couldn't actually see David most of the time. Secondly, of course, David had the most effective technology in the ancient world, the sling, which was more lethal than anything else. But, of course, what he doesn't say is that that's not what David attributed his victory to. He attributed to the fact that he had God on his side. He had this enormous self-belief, which brings us to the interesting connection, I think, between religion and war. There are many parallels and similarities there in terms of the dynamics of, of each. I, I wanted to pick up something Justin has said. That, I mean, you know, we have spent a long period with uh, nuclear weapons uh, without the destruction of the planet, but maybe one of the reasons is that the people who had hold of the nuclear weapons were essentially secular societies. Uh, would you not agree that it's more likely that a, a, a religious society would actually use a nuclear weapon since it knows that there's another world to go to? Well, not all religious uh, uh, systems do have no. the sense <laughs> of either an afterlife or an omnipotent. But some of the big ones do. Some of the big ones do. Um, who knows? Um, but I think, um, I, I think we... Ha you just have to keep reminding yourself that sometimes the only sort of non-violent show in town has also been the result of religion. And the, the, there has have been continual voices raised throughout history by the great reformers uh, to say... Uh, to stop structural violence, the oppression of the, of the vast majority of the population, and uh, to try to inculcate a sense of respect for 
the stranger, the foreigner, uh, and for all people on the planet. Um, I, w- I would agree that, historically speaking, where you see the source of that is very often religion, but it now exists in yes, entirely secular exactly. forms, does it not? It, 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 it does indeed, and I think we need to sort of accelerate uh, those forms and, and those stories in a secular guise. We're running out of time. I just wanted to ask uh, you, Christopher Coker, about another phrase you use, uh, which will be a red flag, I think, to, to some readers. You write about um, technology devaluing the sacramental idea of war. And you write about it as that, as that, as being a bad thing. We have spent, I don't know what, 80 years learning that dulce et decorum est is not true. You seem to imply that there is a, tr- a kind of truth in that, or that there is a sacramental aspect to war which is useful. Well, I think if you talk to a lot of... Uh, are we allowed to use the word geeks or nerds now? I suspect we're not. With respect. Um, they, they actually have a very religious idea of, uh, of technology. They talk about the singularity, uh, which has even been dated to 2142, when God comes back into the picture. It's the rapture, uh, essentially, but this time it's a machine that will save us because we can't save ourselves. You talk to any of the cyber warriors in cyberspace, and uh, they see God in cyberspace. It may not be the traditional God, but it's certainly there. You're looking worried. No, I'm not looking worried. I'm looking (laughs) amused uh, because uh, having written a a history of God, uh, God has taken so many forms uh, over, over the millennia uh, that this is just a very interesting and fascinating um, uh, evolution. Um, just very quickly, because we're running, is it is it useful though to think of war as something that can be noble? Anything can be noble to a certain extent. Mm. It depends what purposes you put it to. But uh, I would just remind you of Ellis Canetti's point that uh, God wasn't killed by Nietzsche. He was hiding in the atom and he revealed himself in 45. OK, we have to stop there. Unfortunately, it's a good ending. Uh, Karen Armstrong's Fields of Blood, Religion and the History of Violence is out now. As are Justin Marozzi's History of Baghdad and Christopher Coker's Can War Be Eliminated? Next week, a battle of a different kind, capitalism and the environment. Naomi Klein and Dieter Helm talk to Anne McElvoy. For now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free. Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. As British jets take to the air over Iraq again and the Islamic State encroaches on Baghdad, our subjects this morning could scarcely be more pertinent. The author, Karen Armstrong, an award-winning historian of religion, is here to talk about her book Fields of Blood, in which she sets out to refute what she sees as a false association between religion and violence. Religion has been made a scapegoat, she argues, for crimes and killings that find their real causes elsewhere. Christopher Coker, Professor of International Relations at the LSE, is taking on an entrenched received opinion too because his short polemic, Can War Be Eliminated?, opens with the provocative statement that war is not just a bad idea that we can cash in for a better one. And religion, war and a sense of historical inevitability also come together in Justin Marozzi's study of Baghdad. Once the intellectual centre of the known world... ...idea of religion as a separate activity... Uh, cordoned off from all others um, and um, with a centering around a supernatural god with a, a set of beliefs and practices that are standard throughout. So is your argument that, as it were, in the pre-modern era, uh, it's impossible to single out religion yes. because you can't single out religion in any case? It's all it's, so much intermingled. Yes. Now, what about the, po- that, the, the, the era that follows when religion in certain societies has been established as a kind of private business, your own confessional um, entitlement, but nothing to do with the state. Uh, that, uh, that's, in, that's in Western countries mainly, um, and I, you can't really say uh, that things have been any the less violent, um, because I think warfare, I, I think, I, will always be with us. Um, and lot, for many reasons, not least because men just love fighting. Um, and uh, the st- they got rid of one religion, then they created another, the devotion to the nation, which they celebrated in elaborate rituals. 
and uh, the nation has had an extremely violent history. Um, that's a bit of a catch-22 for your argument, though, isn't it? I mean, I, thought, I think that's interesting. You make the point several, uh, several places mm. in the book that um, nationalism is converted into a kind of secular religion. Yes. So it is the religious instinct that's a problem here. Well, I, I, what is the religious instinct? Because... Uh, well, I, to, to, <laughs> you're to, better equipped to answer yes, that than me. So. To, uh, to, to paraphrase uh, a famous commercial, um, the weather does lots of different things and so does religion. Um, it's not all about peace, nor is it all about war. Sometimes uh, religion has actually tried to sort of extract uh, violence, both from its own traditions, rituals, and, and ideologies. Uh, and, and, and that has been a con as continuous a theme in the history of religion as any wars or... state cannot exist without its armies. Um, a state needs... It, it is based on a forcible... Uh, suppression of people. You, you go into detail about all yes. of the other reasons, the economic reasons, uh, as it were, even the racial reasons for war. But you also quote um, Chris Hedges, who's a, a New York Times mm. war correspondent, rather pointedly. You, say, he, you quote him and he writes this, Most of us willingly accept war as long as we can fold it into a belief system that paints the ensuing suffering as necessary for a higher good. Uh, isn't that precisely the point that nothing we found is as good as religion for providing that belief system. I, I think nationalism has also been uh, very good I mean, uh, f at creating warfare and its short history. I mean, it's quite interesting that the French revolutionaries uh, tried to abolish Catholicism uh, and did so very violently in Fr France after the revolution. And no sooner... Now a violent shadow of its former glory. And also, one might add, exhibit number one for anyone wanting to put the case that uh, religion is at the heart of many of the bloodier conflicts in history. Karen Armstrong, you've set out to challenge that idea with your book. Are you taking issue with a, a specifically modern idea, what you might call the missionary atheism of, say, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, or is this an older notion that I, you're attacking? I think it dates back to the early modern period, which is the time when we separated religion and politics um, and created the first sort of secular ideology. Um, and I'm not saying, actually, that religion is never a factor, um, it, it's, but it's never the sole one, nor is it even the chief one. Um, religion in pre-modern uh, society permeated all aspects of life, all activities, and um, the, uh, no other uh, culture has anything like our 